Cita Blanco, the Earth and Sister, and today we're reading Saru Nastra Shikot. This is Chapter 7, Scar Tissue. What sort of employment do you have in mind? Nothing sorted, I can assure you. I need a scribe, someone who knows the language of the kingdom, and it would it will help grandson legitimacy, legitimacy to the work that we do, explained Shikot. If you want to scribe, there are plenty of other people more suitable to the task. I said sitting down beside him. You are the one I want, Joseph, said Chica, putting his only hand on my shoulder. This motion alone was enough to compel me to do his bidding. Against my mother's wishes, I took Chica's offer. Ever since she had lost her job, she had allowed me to do whatever I pleased. She got re re relegated to my mother the role of housekeeper. It was a role she was already used to. After a month, she was almost back to her normal self. She meekly accepted her new situation and even called Chicot Lord Jean Antoine. After many conversations between Chicot and Alvis and the other children, I was able to piece together their story up to this point. Like Gita had said before, Chicot and his friends wandered the outskirts of the forest for some time. Those that knew how to hunt illegally captured the deer belonging to the Unheim clan. They eventually made their way to a hut in the middle of the forest. The hut was inhabited by a witch who healed their wounds. Since her livelihood depended on secrecy, she sent them on their way after three days. From there, they took a boat to Escada Bay. While working on the funds, Gita's mother, Adona, and her daughters came to see them with whatever supplies they could take from Sufton. And while working in the field, she got was struck with an inspiration. Together, they went into the forest to collect dead leaves. They also collected bone meat, cow dung, and bad one. They sold it to the local farmer as a super miracle fertilizer which could triple the crop growth. The fertilizer also came with brand new plow tools made by the master craftsman Alvis. Even if it was disgraced, the name Alvis still carried some weight. Also news, also news tended to travel quite slowly between the independent merchant towns. The scraps of metal were taken from the nearby graveyards. Just <laughs> like, like to necromancy. <laughs> like that didn't break the bad luck before. <laughs> The new fertilizers and new tools were given for free in exchange for 10% of the true output. At the time, it was common for farmers to lie about their crop yield. Farming was a bit of a hidden miss business, so lying was a means of stocking up for the bad times. The Bicerca lords knew this, knew this, so farming was treated with kid gloves. The feudal lords, however, were not so lenient. It was not too uncommon for them to drive for a poor farmer's hut in search of hidden supply goods. Of all the farmers that refused their fertilizer, more than half were true to their promise. While the solid stores, with the solid stores of goods, Chicago was able to sell them at a reasonable price in Little Sophia. At the time he came, the town was, was being ravaged by starvation. Normal farmers who had taken advantage of the situation, but now she cut. He made a decent profit and the locals did not starve to death. She cut screwed even went as far as giving away food to the needy. Since this merchant town was without any official lords or noble household, Chicot quickly filled in the power void. His generosity earned him the love and respect of his peers, and during the last three months, Chicot had been solidifying his hold in the community. From time to time, there was a hint of a formation of a guild, and Chicot nipped those attempts in the bud through charity work. Originally, guilds had been created to support a certain type of business during times of need. They were designed to spread knowledge and bear the brunt of the starting a new business venture. These days the guilds were associated with oppression, slave labor, secret murders, and backwater ideas. They seem almost, almost opposed to any form of progress that would jeopardize their, their status. After becoming financially sovereign, Chicago added barracks to his house, and over time he started getting more wins until he became a gorgeous little man the gorgeous little manor that I saw that night. While walking uh, in the manor in the morning, I saw plenty of familiar faces. It seemed as if Chicago had taken with him a good portion of the residents of Sumstead. Among them there was the former Warriors Guild. Under Chicago's leadership, he had organized those 231 kills made into his own personal guard. He had always kept 200 strong at home at all times. The rest of the 31 were allowed to retain some of their autonomy. He kept them all in shape by rationing their food and orchestrating training drills. He also demanded that they bathe at least once a day. 
As for the children, they were in uh, they were in the development team. They had gotten rid of their journeyman license and to work on the Chicago directly. And about a third was into the development of new products to sell. Another third worked with Avid in perfecting the tools related to their craft. The, ma the remaining groups micromanaged the new apprentices that were not allowed into the workshop. Chicago was insistent in doing the interviews directly. He was not going to listen to Shams. Time, bro? Eight minutes. Aside from the humans, Chicago employed dwarves and elves. The elves had a unique way of refining glass that made it see through. The dwarves, as far as I could tell, did not contribute in any significant way as far as knowledge was concerned. They didn't manage the dwarves' wells, and their tiny hands were perfect for miniature works. As for me, I spent most of the day drafting trade manifests, business letters, contracts, and other important legal documents that Chicago couldn't bother with. Chicago was always particular about the wording, and most of the letters he made, he made, he had me do sounded like implied death threats. One day I confronted Chicago on this matter, and he simply laughed and said, "You have quite a stupid imagination, Joseph." Chicago only devoted eight hours of the day to official business. The rest of the time he spent it in leisure. I too was allowed some flexibility, flexibility with my mandatory eight-hour work schedule. And despite this leeway, I had the bad habit of getting work done on my spare time. And during one of such working fits, she got into my study, go holding a gorgeous life-size dog. Then again, it, do, it looked life-size in comparison to Chicago's diminutive statue. stature. Looking at the dog, I commented, Chicago, are you ever going to grow up? I could ask you the same thing, Joseph. What are you doing here? said Chicago sternly. You know what I'm doing here, Lord Jean, I retorted. The work is never going to end, Joseph. Catching up with work is a meaningless effort, said Chicago, dancing with the porcelain doll. Pulling my quill down, I said angrily, maybe if you did not spend so much time loafing around, this little empire of yours would get somewhere. Sheesh. You are no fun, said Chicago, believing my study. Time, bro? 7 minutes, 30 seconds. After working with Chicago for five months, our relationship had gotten quite strained. His layback attitude was contrasting with the gruesome work habits I had developed as an apprentice. And looking back, I realized that I was angry with Chicago for another reason. And ever since I had discovered that Gita had married Chicago, I had become quite irritable whenever they were together. Chicago's marriage with Gita was odd, that was odd to say the least. It was never consummated as far as I knew. Chicago was like Chicago's favorite toy. He would dress her up in some of the most imaginative dresses I would ever see. Chicago practiced action with Gita, however, he used a crossbow instead of a bow. Abbey had modified Chicago's crossbow to make reloading easier. The couple would also play pretend they would play with board games and other physical games like toss the ball, hard crocos, hide and seek daggers, or they would go swimming. Hard crocos? Yeah, that's a hot cockles. I don't know, it's a weird game, medieval game that I looked up, so then I added it to the list. I don't know what, I don't remember what it does. <laughs> yeah, I was about to ask, I was like, oh, what is hot cockles? Swimming was a relatively new thing. Most of my contemporaries did not know how to swim. Those that did were considered witches. When allowed into the pool, she got demanded that his people wear skimpy little outfits. His reasoning was that wearing heavy clothing would cause you to, to drown. Due to much complaining from the married men, Chicago was forced to add a second in the pool to segregate male from female swimmers. Ignoring the cottons, Chicago would swim with his cute little wife in the guy's swimming pool. The men had enough common sense not to make any room or remarks or even to stare. Chicago was the lord of the manor and he could do whatever he felt like in, in his own home. Close to that, Chicago entered my study again, this time with Gita. Gita said in her sweet voice, my dear, Jean, my dear Jean has told me that you have not taken any swimming lessons. When am I ever going to need to learn such a skill? I said, not looking up. It's going to be the swimming check of swimming lesson. <laughs> she caught press a room on the wall and my entire study was aglow with a yellow light. Shuckling, I said, turning, out, turning it off. I keep forgetting about the stupid gimmick. She caught was about to say something, but he closed his mouth. I heard the dull, uneven footsteps of Alvis. Based on his gibberish, he was drunk again. When Alvis finished passing over, Chicago said, Come swim with us, Joseph. It will help you relax. 
at the most flattery, she couldn't get the man to convince her to go swimming with him. Time, bro? Five minutes. The pool had a strange gel, greenish glow. The mosaic at the bottom was clearly defined. It had a depiction of a serpent biting its tail. Before stepping within, she called said, wait, I need to adjust the level. By pressing a towel, the pool expanded inside and it got shallower as well. The mosaic too grew inside with some other fantastic creatures joining the serpent. After the pool transformed, she cut through me an undergarment that covered, jo that covered only my buns and my privates. Rolling my eyes, I went to another room and I changed into that. When I came back, I saw Giza wearing a bizarre looking attire. It resembled undergarments, except that they were one fabric pressed against the skin. It was sleeveless and it was suspended by two red ribbons tied around the shoulders. The skirt was really so, high uh, cut. Bikini? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> like a one piece. It's a modern swimsuit. Okay. Before getting a better look at her, she got to a towel in my face and said, Stop shaking out my wife. My gaze soon went towards she called. I saw the green scar being made by his missing arm. It was just cut over the shoulder. His back too was severely scarred from the lacerations made by the wig. She got hold, holding his wounded shoulder said, Get over your guilt, Joseph. Your silence will have only made you share my face. I'm fine. It no longer hurts. Gita hugged Chikara and she started crying. Shaking his head, Chikara said, No, look, no, look what you've done. He made the waifu cry. <laughs> my eyes started to look cloudy and I felt a knot on my throat. I took a, I took a step back, desiring to run away from it all. Sensing this, she cut, said vehemently, do not run away from this, Joseph. Taking another step back, I ran, a, I, I ran away towards my room, and I did not bother changing. My mother, who was waiting for me inside, said, by the gods, what's the matter with you, Joseph? She added, what are you wearing? Ignoring her questions, I hugged her waist, and as I used to when I was a mere babe, and then I proceeded to sob like a child. All right, and I begin that's, yeah, I'm his twin suit. Okay. All right, with, uh, with a chapter. Bye-bye. God bless.